Hello, everyone. So welcome to this talk. So uh, the subject of my talk will be SAR imaging. So I will try to give you an introduction about this kind of uh, imaging. And then we will see uh, a range of application using this kind of acquisition. And then in the second part of my talk, I will focus a little bit on image processing and especially on the subject of noise reduction. As you will see, we have lots of noise in these images, which is called SPACAL, and there are plenty of uh, methods to try to reduce this noise. I will try to give you an overview of the methods that have been developed to reduce the SPACAL in our images, and I will do a focusing about deep learning approaches. So I would like to thank uh, my co-author, especially for the second part, so Loic, so we are working, uh, we have a long-standing collaboration, but also Emmanuele Dal Sasso and Ines Maramia, who are PhD students. Okay. So here is the outline of my presentation. So as I told you, I will do two parts in the talk. So in the first part, it will be quite uh, uh, an introduction, let's say, about SAR imaging. And then I will show you some applications and some SAR sensor, so some satellites that are actually acquiring images of the Earth. And then in the second part, I will, it will be a little bit more technical and I will describe the statistical modeling of SAR images. And then I will uh, focus on some uh, methods based on deep learning to reduce the speckles that you have on this image. Okay, so let's start with uh, the acquisition of this kind of images. So, okay, so our aim is to study the Earth. So we would like to have some information about uh, some processing that are occurring uh, on the Earth's surface uh, of different kinds. And uh, you have two main families to be able to acquire images of the Earth. Okay, you have the uh, systems which are based on um, passive acquisition systems, which are mostly using the illumination of the Earth, for instance, by the sun. Okay, so they are just uh, counting the photons if you want uh, at the level of the sensor after the illumination by the, by the sun, but they have no uh, source of illumination of any kind. Uh, in the passive family, you also have uh, the recording of some uh, infrared emissions, for instance, that you may have by the different elements on the ground. But in this talk, I will mostly focus on the second family, which is the active uh, family, active sensor. So the sensor are put on, the, on a satellite or on a plane, for instance. But this time, instead of, you, of using another source of illumination, the sensor has its own source of illumination, so it will send a wave, an electromagnetic wave, toward the, sun, toward the Earth, so you see that the orange uh, waves that is drawn, and then the signal will be backscattered by the element that you have on the Earth, okay? And then the antenna uh, will uh, go in the uh, reception mode, and it will record the signal that is backscattered, and then it can you can downlink it on a on a station that is uh, on the Earth to be able to process the signal and extract information. But here we are mostly in this situation, and uh, we are trying to extract information about the about the Earth. So it's almost the same uh, message on this slide. So you see, you have this antenna it will illuminate a portion of the earth on the ground that the swath of the antenna and more precisely for each pulse that is sent by the sensor part of the pulse is usually backscattered in the direction of the antenna okay so in fact the, the characteristics of my sensor is that i have only one antenna Okay, we are in what is we call the monostatic case, meaning that it's the same antenna that is sending the signal and then that is recording the backscattered signal. Okay, why are we losing, using lateral viewing? It's just because you see, if I use some vertical sending of the pulse, I will have a mixture of the points on the right and on the left of the vertical, so I will not be able to discriminate the points on the earth. Okay. So lateral viewing and only one antenna that will do the emission, but also the reception of the, of the, of the waves. 
Okay, so you may ask, but we have very nice uh, photos that you have probably seen on TV of the Earth. Why using SAR sensor? Okay, because as you will see, these images, they are quite uh, difficult to understand. There are lots of noise and geometric distortions, and it's not as easy as the images that you may think of when thinking about images of the Earth. So why are we using this uh, radar sensor? So the first uh, reason is that this uh, sensor, you can use them uh, in any situation because you have your own source of illumination. You don't, don't need to have the sun, so you can use, for instance, these images, you can use this sensor even during night, okay? So that can be useful for military applications, for instance. But uh, a more important point for us is that because we are using waves uh, with the gigahertz frequency, they will go through the clouds, okay? So we will have something that will penetrate a signal that will penetrate the cloud and we will be able to acquire an image whatever the weather condition and in, in fact it's a very important point because for instance for some tropical regions that you have on the earth it's very very difficult to obtain an optical image you only have five or ten percent of the optical images that can really that are really useful because of the clouds that you have on this image Okay, for SAR images, you always have an interesting signal because you will penetrate the, cloud, uh, um, the, the, the clouds using these wavelengths. The first point um, is the fact that for each pixel, what we will obtain is a complex number. Okay, because we are sending an electromagnetic wave, what we will record is not only a magnitude is not only some power that is backscattered by the elements on the earth of the of the by the element on the earth but also we will record a phase information okay and this phase information as we will see in the following of the presentation it is linked with some geometric information because the phase depends on the distance between the sensor your satellite on the points on the earth okay and by using this information you will be able to recover some information on the elevation of the points on the ground and even on the movement on this point on the ground so that's very very useful information not so easy to um, exploit but we will see a few examples in the following uh, okay, so in summary, we, we have a, an information which is very complementary to the information that you may have with optical images. Okay, but there are also some difficulties, as I have told you. We, we have lots of noise, which is called the speckle, we, meaning that we have very strong radiometric fluctuations on the images. Okay, I will discuss this phenomenon in more details in the second part and see how we can try to reduce it. But that's a, a strong drawback of these uh, images. The other point is that we will be very sensitive, sensible to the geometric distortion. Okay, the geometry of the scene will be very important uh, on, on the signal that will be backscattered. And it may be difficult to understand these images. So let's uh, have a closer look to the way we can create an image. So I just say, Okay, you send an electromagnetic wave and then you record the backscattered signal, but let's explain exactly how we will obtain the image. So as I told you, we have the satellite, so it's going on, a, on some orbit, uh, orbital trajectory. So here you have the sensor, which is your antenna, and then you will send a wave uh, toward, the, toward the Earth. So you send a radar pulse, okay? with this kind of uh, frequency, meaning approximately, let's say, 10 gigahertz, meaning that the wavelength is about approximately a few centimeters, okay? Let's say five to 10 centimeters. Of course, it depends on the frequency that you are using when sending the pulse. So the, the radar pulse, uh, well, propagate in the atmosphere, okay? And then it will reach the ground and in this situation, you may have different uh, configurations. So here, you see that the radar pulse is reflected in this direction. So meaning that 
nothing is backscattered towards the sensor, so I will have almost no signal for this point on the ground, meaning that I will have a black pixel, let's say, in my image, okay? Because the, the energy of the pulse is not uh, reflected towards uh, my antenna. Okay, but my, my antenna is continue, uh, to continue to propagate along the swath. Okay, and let's suppose that now we are reaching this target. And this time, I have a scattering of the signal in many directions. And of course, part of the signal will be also backscattered towards the sensor. Okay, so what will happen? I will have part of the energy that will be sent back to my antenna, and you see, what will be recorded by the antenna will be the contribution of this point on the ground, okay? So, to summarize what happens, you are illuminating all this swath on the ground. If you record the signal in time, you will first have some information about parts of this swath, and then along the swath, all the pixels will contribute to this uh, information. So, the backscattering of the pulse will give you information of all the different elements that lie on the ground in the swath. Okay, so let's suppose that one pulse will provide you with one line of the image, you will obtain a pixel just by cutting in time the received signal. Okay, so here I will have one pixel, another one, and another one, and another one, and I know which where is my pixel? Because I have the time of flight for each of the pixels of my image. Okay, so for one pulse, I obtain one line of my image. So now my satellite is moving and I will send a new pulse and I will have another line of my image. Okay, and then my, my satellite will move and it will acquire many, many different uh, lines of my image. And for each line, I will have the cutting in pixels. Okay, but you see here, uh, well, this swath, it's quite large on the ground, okay? It's not very accurate. So what does it mean when I say, okay, you just are cutting some pixels? Well, it's very big pixels, okay? So it means that each pixel, it's in this direction, like a few kilometers. So it's not very interesting for an image, okay? It's, it's too big. You can't recognize small objects on the ground, okay? But you see what is interesting is that my blue target, it has been seen by this pulse, the first one, but also by this one, and also by this one, and it will be seen by many pulses, okay? So the contribution of the blue target will be recorded, if you want, in many lines of my, uh, of my antenna, okay? And what is interesting, and it's why my system is not just a radar imaging system, but a synthetic aperture radar imaging system, is that I will try to exploit this information, the fact that my blue target has been seen by many positions of the antenna, to be able to recover a much finer information about this blue point, okay? So the main idea is that we will numerically combine all these lines, but it's just like a convolution, let's say, in this direction, and we will be able to do a kind of focusing in this direction. And instead of having this green pattern, which was very wide on the ground, what you will obtain is a very fine diffraction pattern at the end, after having done the combination of all the pulses. Okay, so just by creating what is called a synthetic aperture, which means combining all the position of the antenna, where you have seen the target, it's just as if you do a very, very big antenna. And by you doing so, you are just acquiring a very thin line on the, on the ground. Okay, so instead of having a coarse image, let's say, I will have a much uh, resolved one with small pixels that will be very useful for many applications. Okay, so I'm, I'm not explaining the signal processing that is behind all of that, but just I hope you catch the main idea, which is just the fact of combining many 
backscattered signals to be able to recover the precise uh, information about the blue target. Okay, so here is an example of an image. So your, your satellite is moving this way. So it's sending many, many, many pulses. Uh, and then for each pulses that is uh, backscattering uh, towards the sensor, you will obtain a line and the combination of all these lines will give you an image, okay? But you see, you remember in my first slide, I said, oh, be careful, we will have some geometric uh, distortions. That's because of this lateral viewing. You see here, you have the Etna Volcano. And in fact, the, the part of the Etna Volcano that is uh, seeing the sensor, which, which will, be, will, will be much brighter than the other part of the volcano. Okay, so you, you will have a kind of dissymmetry of the backscattering properties of the object, depending on their own geometry and their relationship to the position of the sensor. Okay, so any questions on this part? No? Okay, so what, what, uh, what are the signals that we will really uh, manipulate in the following? So you, you, you've seen we, we are able to obtain an image. So what I have described was mostly this case. What you have seen in the previous slide is just the amplitude of the backscattered field. Okay, here for each pixel, it's just the power that is backscattered towards the antenna. Okay, so that's the first kind of image. If you just have one image, you can just take the modulus, the magnitude of the complex field, and you will have uh, an amplitude image, and you can do some mapping, uh, cartography, extract information about the objects that you have on the Earth. But as I've told you, let's suppose now that instead of having one image, you are able to record two images. Your sensor is as first acquired an image when it was at position one. And let's suppose, because of the orbit of the satellite, if you wait a little bit, one day, it will come again almost on the same track, and it will be able to acquire a new image. Okay, so let's suppose you have this two image with a very slight different, uh, difference of positions between these two acquisitions. If you have that, what you can do is to do what is called interferometry and instead of just having the magnitude of the complex field this time you will take the two complex numbers you will compute the phase difference between them and you will have an information which is linked to the elevation of the point on the ground okay so if you have interferometric information you will have this kind of image here is image one here is image two they look very similar because the position is almost the same between the two acquisitions. Indeed, you must see almost the same scene, but with a slightly different incidence angle. And in this case, when you compute the phase different, you see the fringes here. They are linked with the elevation of the point. Okay? The more fringes I have, the more uh, difference of elevation I am measuring. Okay? So that's a very, very powerful uh, information because it means that using a satellite which is really far away from the earth you may have a very accurate information about the elevation of the points on the ground okay so of course it's, it's not easy to obtain a digital elevation model because you see since we have a phase we have to do some unwrapping of the phase the phase is is measured modulo 2 pi so you you have to be able to uh, get rid of this uh, modulo but anyway, you have a very accurate information about the elevation of the point. Another uh, kind of image is the case where instead of just having one complex number for each pixel, you are using the polarization of the waves, okay? So you may send a wave with a certain polarization and then switch your antenna to do the reception with an over polarization or keep the same polarization but anyway you will have different combination of polarization that will provide you for each pixel not only one complex number but three or four complex numbers depending on the combination of the polarization 
And what is important is that this polarization, they will provide you much more information about the geophysical properties of the pixels. Okay, for instance, you will be able to recognize multiple bounces that have occurred inside the pixel, single bounce, double bounce, and many interesting properties that you may have at the, at the scale of the pixel that could be recovered by using polarimetric information. Okay, usually we are using two main polarization, which are called vertical and horizontal polarization. So we have three combination, horizontal, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, horizontal, vertical, and vertical, vertical, but both horizontal and vertical are symmetric. So in fact, you only have three complex numbers that are useful for each pixel. Okay, so let's uh, put some notations, some mathematical notations that we will use in the following. So, as I've said, if you, and un we, we will see some images now. So, you, you have the antenna, so you are sending the wave, and then, depending on the distance towards the sensor, you are illuminating different parts of the Earth. Okay, so here is pixel number i, number i plus one, and so forth, and so forth. So here, let's suppose we only have one sensor, I'm just recording one complex number for each pixel. Okay, so the complex number is just ki here. And here, this image is just the modulus or the square of the modulus, which is called the intensity that is observed for each pixel. So I'm not sure you recognize very well the information, but you see, so it's an airborne image, so quite high resolution image. So each pixel is less than one meter uh, on, on, the, on the ground. So you see here, you, you, you have a road. I don't know if you recognize things, and probably maybe you see some trees. You see they are like small, uh, small dots, and, and you have a, a shadow behind each tree, which is just like a small uh, black circle. Because each time you have no backscattered signal, of course, you have something which is dark on the image. Okay, so it was the case where you just have what is called an intensity image, so you can do some uh, mapping of the different information that you see. And here is the situation where I have two uh, images that are recorded. Okay, so as I told you, usually people wait for uh, the satellite to come back on the same track. Okay, so it may be a few days okay, like 20 days, even 30 days, uh, before you acquire a new image, which is very close from the previous one, okay? So in this case, you have two uh, signal, two complex signal which are recorded for pixel I, sensor one and sensor two. And here what you see, so it's not as nice as what I shown you before. This time you see it's very, very noisy. Okay, but it's the same information, it's just the phase difference between what you have seen with the first sensor and what you have seen with the second sensor. Okay, and here it's called what is called the coherence. So it's just like a, a kind of measurement of the reliability of the different, uh, of the two complex signals that you have acquired. Okay, if they are in agreement, it's quite white, you have a high value. And if they are in disagreement, you will have a low value. What does it mean if you have a low value? It means that the interferometric phase is not reliable. Okay, you cannot use it. For instance, in shadow areas, where you have no information, in fact, you will see that the coherence is very low. It's just meaning that the phase will not be uh, exploitable if you want. Okay, and let's move to the last case. Instead of having two uh, complex numbers. I am in the polarimetric configuration and you see this time for each pixel I have a small vector of three complex numbers. Okay, here you see is a color a composition of this three of the magnitude of these three complex numbers. But what we are interested in, in, in fact uh, for the physical uh, understanding of the image, is this uh, polarimetric covariance matrix. 
Okay, so you just take your vector, the uh, conjugate and transpose, and then you just compute the, the expectation, and that will provide you many information about the physical parameters that you have uh, for the surface on the ground. And you can even combine these two kind of acquisition, meaning that instead of having interferometry, two complex numbers, polarimetry, three channels, you may have even what is called polynsar, which is a combination of both, and that will provide you this, uh, this small uh, vector, and you have the three different combinations for all the pixels. Okay, so that's all the situation that you may try to, to use when you are dealing with SAR uh, images. Okay, so maybe to have a short uh, a break about this uh, complex uh, stuff, uh, I will show you some images and try to explain to you uh, some of the space sensors that are acquiring some images at the moment and why uh, are they acquiring images. Okay, so I will show you just some space uh, mission. So in fact, we, we had uh, two different generations of SAR sensor. So the first generation you see, it's quite uh, some time ago now, because the first sensor was sound in the, at the end of the 90s. And uh, here, this first family, they had not very good resolution. Let's say between 10 meters and 20 meters for each pixel on the ground. Okay, so I have tried to explain to you that we use uh, different uh, lines and we combine them to do the, what is called the synthetic aperture. Okay, that's in the direction of the movement of the satellite. But in fact, we are also doing uh, some signal processing to improve the image also in the range direction, in the direction where you send the wave. Okay, because if you don't do anything, you just take your signal. Usually the signal is too long. And again, it will give you a very big pixel of a few kilometers, okay? So to improve this point, what is done is that instead of using a single frequency, that is the frequency of your, of your radar, in fact, you are doing some modulation of this frequency. Around the central frequency, you are doing some modulation of the frequency and then you will uh, be able to do some focusing in this direction. So the bandwidth here is responsible of the resolution that you have in the range direction, in the direction where you stand the pulse, okay? So the higher this band, the better the resolution. Okay, and again, it's some convolution and signal processing that you are doing, but that's very well uh, mastered by the uh, space agencies. Okay, so you see the bandwidth, they are quite small. Here you have the uh, wavelength that we are using. We are using approximately frequency of five gigahertz, okay, meaning that the wavelength is around uh, five, six centimeters. Uh, why is this parameter important? It's because it will, uh, it will have a great influence on the way the ground will backscatter the, the wave that has been sent, okay? So the smoother the ground, the more reflected will be the, the wave. And when it is reflected, usually you have no signal that is recorded by the antenna, okay? So what you need is to have a wavelength which is in agreement with the application that you are interested in. If you are interested in urban areas, you need to have a small wavelength. If you are interested in vegetation areas, we, you don't mind because it's very rough. Vegetation has many variations, so you can use a, a, a big wavelength and be able to penetrate inside the vegetation. Okay, so and here, so you have the altitude. So it, just to give you uh, an information, it's approximately eight, 800 kilometers above the Earth for the, all the satellites. And here you have the cycle, which is the number of days you have to wait of course, the, the Earth is rotating uh, when, the, when the satellite is just having its, uh, its trajectory, its orbital trajectory, so the Earth is rotating, but you don't come back exactly at the same point. So before you come back exactly at the same point, you need to wait, for instance, for this one, you need to wait 35 days, 
Okay, so quite a long time before you can have some interferometric acquisition. Okay, it's important for interferometry the, the, the cycle information. Okay, so here uh, you, you have uh, the Canadian Space Agency, but of course Europe was very active in sending a satellite to do SAR acquisition. So they were the first with ERS-1 to have a very, very uh, regular acquisitions that have been provided to the scientific community. And the successor of ERS-1 was Envisat, which is here, who has taken many, many images. But you see, we were still with quite big pixels, 10 to 20 meters. So just to show, well, I have an example later. But you will see that it's not easy to recognize the objects when you have uh, pixels of 20 meters, for instance. So the, the next generation, which is a very, very nice generation because we had metric resolution images. And you see why we had such an improvement. It's because of this value here. You remember I said you have some central frequency and then you have a frequency modulation and this bandwidth is uh, controlling the, the frequency modulation that you are applying. And the bigger, the better, okay? So here you see that this uh, German uh, sensor was very uh, interesting because it can have a um, resolution with less than one meter, okay? But anyway, all these sensors, they are quite interesting because we are reaching one meter by one meter approximately for the pixels on the ground okay so you see the altitude is almost the same but the cycles they are also reduced it depends of course of the choice of the altitude and the exact uh, depression angle that you are using for well, there are many factors but what i maybe is not seen on this table is that people have started to launch not only one sensor but constellations of sensor meaning that instead of just sending one satellite you send two satellites or three satellites or even four satellites and of course you divide this number each time you send a new sensor okay so for instance sentinel one has a, a twin which was sentinel one b so we had only six days between two acquisitions to do interferometry okay so, and even for uh, Cosmos SkyMed, for instance, you had four satellites on the constellation. Okay? So here you have the TerraSaric sensor. Here you have Sentinel-1, which is uh, again provided by a uh, European Space Agency. Why is this uh, sensor very nice? That's because all the data are completely freely available. Okay? So you can just go on a website and choose some track and some area on the on the earth and you can just have uh, a, a star image uh, of the of the area you would like to study okay so it was a change of policy because you see even for this one uh, you had to propose some scientific project to have images and it was uh, uh, half private and half a state uh, delivery let's say of images Okay, so let's have a look to images now. So here you have an image. I don't know if you recognize it. Yeah, hope so. <laughs> okay, anyway, you see it's not so easy to, well, to recognize things. If, if I showed you some optical images of the same area, it would be much easier for you to recognize. Uh, yes, it's Paris. So you see that you have the, the river Seine here, okay. You see also the, the road network, and you see these two parts, which are a little bit with a lower gray level. They correspond to vegetation, to forests, okay? The two big parts, Boulogne and, uh, and Vincennes, okay? But you see, it, it's not very easy to recognize buildings, for instance, even quarters. And that's because you, you have a, a, a mixture of very, very strong backscattering of the buildings, you see this very bright point, and besides, they depend on the orientation of the of the streets compared to the track of the sensor. So my, my sensor is on the left, if you want, sending the waves. Okay, but you see that this part seems brighter than the other part, but anyways, it's kind of mixture of dark and bright pixels, so it's not very easy to understand these images. 
plus the noise that I will talk about before uh, later. But anyway, it's not so easy. If we improve the resolution, so here you have a Radarsat 2 image. It was in my second generation of sensor. You see that things are a little bit clearer. Okay, you still see uh, the river here, and here you start seeing the Tour Eiffel. Okay, so why is it uh, with such distortion? So again, my sensor is on the left, so I have some geometric distortion depending on the distance between the sensor and the points that are on the ground. And what you see behind the Tour Eiffel is a dark part, which is the shadow that you have uh, because of the sounding of the wave. But anyway, you, you, you see much clearly streets and the bridges, and also you start seeing some of the buildings. If you even go uh, with a higher resolution, okay, so here is a terrasaric image. So in fact, it's even less than one meter because of this very big bandwidth I have spoken about before. You see that we can recognize much clearly the different objects on the ground, and especially you see different parts of the Eiffel Tower that are backscattering differently depending on the geometry that you have for the different parts of the Eiffel Tower. Okay, is it clear for all of you what we see on this image? So again, why is the water not, uh, not backscattering anything towards the sensor or very few signal? It's because it's very smooth compared to the wavelength. So most of the signal is reflected in another direction. So nothing is uh, recorded in the, um, by the antenna in reception. Okay. Okay, so, okay, I've shown you many sensors and also some images, so mostly in urban areas, but the question is, okay, why are these uh, images useful? What can we do with them? What, which kind of information can we extract? And, okay, what people do with these images? So, usually people uh, separate uh, applications on land and application on the ocean, okay? So for land application, I will show you some, some slides, but you, you have mainly things which are related to mapping, which are the first uh, four uh, applications. So for instance, you want to, to do some uh, agriculture uh, monitoring, so you would want to distinguish between the different uh, plantations that have been done, for instance. Uh, you also have forestry managing, flood mapping, I will show you uh, examples. And the second uh, class of application is mostly related to interferometry. Okay, of course, you can also use interferometry for this one, but you, you have a, a, a wide range of applications which are based on how to compute digital terrain model using the difference of phase between images to do uh, the computation of elevation of the different points on the ground. Okay, and after <laughs> the elevation, you can try to recover the movements of the different points on the ground, and uh, that's everything related to ground movement monitoring. About marine applications, you have, of course, ship detection. In fact, the, the ships are backscattering a lot the, the wave, usually because they have some... Uh, corners, uh, reflectors, or many geometric configurations that will uh, catch the wave and backscatter uh, a high power towards the antenna. So it's usually quite easy to detect the ship, but it's also quite easy to detect uh, oil slick. You have any idea why it's easy to detect oil slick? Sorry? Yes, again, that's very smooth, so it's reflected, so you, you have no signal which is backscattered towards the antenna. So again, you, you have this dark pattern that will be seen. So for instance, the Canadian space agencies, they have very big pro program to be able to do uh, uh, everyday monitoring of the OHPs that can be uh, mapped. But okay, you also have ice monitoring, to, to know where the, the ships could travel and things like that. But in, in fact, I, I have not 
I have not spoken about, uh, mar well, I will not speak uh, very much about marine application because we have some special modes uh, for the SAR sensor to be able to extract information on the ocean, especially on the waves that you have on the ocean, okay? It's not the modes that I have shown you uh, for my image. Okay, so one of the main application which is very, uh, well, up to date, let's say, uh, is the monitoring of forest and especially the detection of uh, deforestation. So again, so you see you have a first image and you have another image which is taken uh, 10 years later approximately and you see that it's quite easy to see on the SAR image uh, which parts of the forest have been destroyed. You see all these black parts, they were not present here, and you have also all this part here, which has increased a lot, okay? So again, it's the same processing as before, when uh, the vegetation is cut, uh, usually in the clear cut, you have a, a, a smoother area, and you have a different signal which is backscattered, or even no, almost no signal that is backscattered, so it's quite easy to detect the deforested area. So here is just an example. Usually people are using either the magnitude of the electromagnetic field, so just the backscattering coefficient, but they can also use polarimetric information to have a, a more accurate uh, information about the way the deforestation has been done. And I must say that it's, it's uh, well, my example is a little bit old, but uh, there is a program of the French Space Agency to have a mapping every day of the global Earth to check if some uh, areas of the Earth have been uh, deforested or not. Okay, and that's where it's important to have radar images because you see in tropical areas where you have lots of clouds, it's really not possible to use optical images. Okay, so SAR images, they are very, very useful for this kind of application. So here you have an example of a map that is provided with, where you have a mapping of the different uh, plantation, the water, but also the state of the forest, uh, depending on the evolution in time. So another application, which is, well, I, I think you, you, you have understood that it's really easy to use the backscattering coefficient when things become smooth. So it's also the case when you have flood, okay, flooded areas, because when the water is propag propagating in the land, again, it's very smooth, so you have no uh, signal which is backscattered towards the sensor. So you see here you have the river, and here you have all the flooded regions that you have uh, after the inundation. Okay, and again, it's very easy to do the detection if you have the image, and that's very useful, for instance, for the uh, rescue uh, vehicles. Okay, you can have this mapping. People do what we call rapid mapping, which is the fact of uh, making maps so that the uh, rescue can arrive as, as fast as they can. And then it is also used by the insurance companies to check if you had uh, a flooded region or not. Okay, but again, you see the principle is, is the same as for oil seek, is the same as for deforestation, is that you will have a change in the backscattering coefficient when you are modifying the roofness of the, of the, of the surface that is imaged. Okay? Um, of course, you can, do uh, what is called activity mapping by just uh, combining images taken at different dates. So here you have an example of a color combination of different images. And you see, depending on the dates, uh, the backscattering coefficient has a different color. So of course, you have a gray level image if the backscattering coefficient is the same in all image. So what does it mean? It means that Every part which is in gray, you have no changes between the different acquisition. And each time you have a color, it just depends on the combination of the different dates. Okay, so for instance, you see here, we see very clearly the boats which were present at some one of the dates, but not of, to all of them. And we can clearly see, for instance, the activities that has arise uh, during the 
duration that we are imagining. Okay, it's very used uh, by companies to analyze the activity on some parts uh, of the earth. Okay, it can be for commercial applications, for instance, the prediction of the energy uh, value or things like that, because it's very, again, you are sure every time to have an image, even if there are some clouds, even if there are smoke or anything that could uh, hinder the acquisition of an optical image. Okay, so you see just by doing a color combination, you see very clearly where you have a different uh, position of the object. Okay, so the application I have shown you, they were mostly based on the analysis of the difference of the backscattering coefficients for the different acquisition. But as I've told you, a very, very um, efficient way of exploiting SAR images is to do interferometry. So here you have a reconstruction, uh, an elevation digital terrain model that has been acquired by using interferometric images. Okay, so again, you take two images with a very, very small uh, difference between the acquisition angle. So usually you wait for the track, for the satellite to go back on the same track. You compute the phase difference. It's not so easy because the phase is very noisy. The phase is wrapped because of the modulo 2 pi, which depends on the configuration, on the geometric configurations between the two acquisition. But then you will be able to have a very accurate uh, digital terrain model uh, of all the Earth. In fact, the German Space Agency, they have launched two satellites to do interferometry the Terrasarix I have mentioned before, and another one which is just very close to the first one so that they can acquire interferometric images with a very short uh, time difference between the two acquisitions. Because of course, if the, if the Earth has changed, you can't really do interferometry because you, you, you have not, the phase difference is not linked to the elevation, but it's linked to the change that you have on the ground. So the, the closer are the two acquisitions, the better will be the interferometric information. Okay, so on, they have a big program to have a commercial digital terrain model of all the Earth by using the two SAR sensor. Okay, but instead of computing the elevation, what you could be interested in could be uh, the movement of the ground. So this uh, specific application is done by using what is called differential interferometry, meaning that instead of having two images, you have 10 images or 20 images, and first you get rid of the elevation. So you just subtract the phase component that is linked to the elevation. And what you are left with, it just, you see, because the phase, what is important is the distance between the sensor and the point. But if the point is moving, the phase is moving because the distance is changing, okay? So what happens if you have movement of the ground, you will directly be able to measure them just by taking the phase information and uh, track the, the phase uh, movement uh, in time. Okay, so that's very, uh, a very, very interesting and very used uh, application for SAR data. So you need to have not two images, but more than that, because usually you will do the tracking of the movement in time. But what you see here is an image of Mexico. Okay, so you, you see Mexico City, a very, very big city. Um, and the problem of Mexico is that it has been built on some... Uh, some area which was quite uh, wet, let's say, which has plenty of water. And, and people are doing pumping, okay, because there is a huge population, and they are pumping more and more the, mo the water that is underground. Okay, and because of this pumping, you, you have some movements because the, the, the ground is becoming drier and drier, so it, it's just like... Uh, going down, if you want, that the subsidence effect. And what you see on this image is the movement of Mexico City on one year. 
and you see that in the blue part you have no movements but everything is moving and for these two parts here you even have a movement which is almost 30 centimeters per year okay so that's a huge movement and what is nice with SAR interferometry is that you may have a global mapping of the movement because of course uh, they are aware of the problem of course and there are plenty of instruments uh, measuring the movement that you have locally on some buildings but you see what is nice with the interferometric information is that we have a big map not only for some small parts of the city but we have a global uh, watch let's say of this movement and they can develop some model of subsidence and try to prevent uh, the destruction of some buildings Okay, and maybe I will stop this part on uh, applications by uh, just showing you two, um, two new projects that will be uh, launched or has been very recently launched. And uh, both of them are linked to uh, environmental applications and they are both are intended to help uh, the measurement of the carbon cycle. Okay, so this one, maybe you've heard about it because they have spoken about it on the radio, that the SWOT mission, it's a collaboration between the American Space Agency, the French Space Agency, and also the Canadian, sorry for the Canadian people, uh, Canadian Space Agency, uh, and they want to study ocean, but also rivers, and they have a very, very big range of application on hydrology. What they want to measure is the level of water uh, that you have on the different rivers and lakes that you have on the earth. Okay, and how will they do that? Uh, so I've spoken many times about interferometry and the fact that you had to wait for the sensor to come back again. So you see here what they do, instead of waiting to have a new acquisition of the same sensor, they have put two antenna on the same sensor. So what does it mean is that, for instance, this antenna is sending the signal and the two antenna will receive the signal. And we will be able to do, in a single pass, interferometry by doing the phase difference between these two acquisitions. Okay, that's a very uh, big uh, revolution, let's say, for uh, this kind of measurements, because this time, you, you are not using the trajectory of the satellite. You are really, really using two satellites at the same time. And another point uh, which is quite unusual for us on SAR imaging is that the wavelength that is used is much smaller than the wavelength we are usually using. And why is it so small? That's because we are interested in water this time. You remember, for all my previous images, we had no information for water. I just say, oh, look, it's smooth. It just, you know, reflected in the opposite direction. So you, we, we have no information, okay? But here, they, they want to have information about the water because they want to have the phase of the water. So what they do is to modify the wavelength to have this time some backscattered signal with a very uh, narrow angle, instead of being with a very large uh, lateral viewing, they are having a much smaller incidence angle, and they are trying uh, to recover information about the water using this kind of uh, specification of the satellite. Okay, so that's, they have launched it uh, in December 21st or something like that. And okay, we are waiting for the, for the images. Okay, but that's a very, well, I hope interesting mission. And hope we will be able to process some of the images. The other mission that is very interesting and is also very new because it's uh, different from what we have um, now is the biomass mission. So this time is a European Space Agency who is uh, managing this uh, satellite. And the, the main objective is to, as the name indicates, in fact, is to be able to uh, study the state of the forest, okay? So uh, this time uh, it will be rapid pass interferometry, so meaning they wait for a new uh, acquisition of the satellite, but uh, this sensor is fully polarimetric, okay? So that's, that's a, a very, I, I did not put it, but uh, 
What is interesting is that they will acquire polarimetric images. And you see again that compared to the example I have shown you before, the wavelength is much uh, longer than what I, I've, I've shown. It's almost uh, 70 centimeters, and that's because you need uh, a very big wavelength to be able to analyze the vegetation, okay? Because you will have kind of penetration inside the vegetation, and thanks to the polarimetry, you will be able to discriminate between the canopy and, and the double bound that you have at the, at the conjunction between the tree, the trunk, and the ground, okay? So you, Using what is called tomography, I have not spoken about that, but you, you are combining this time many acquisition, not only to do interferometry, because with interferometry you have only one elevation for one pixel. With tomography, instead of having one elevation, you have an elevation profile that you can try to reconstruct for each pixel. Okay, which is of course much more interesting and can give you some information about the biomass that you have in the forest. Okay, so biomass is uh, supposed to be launched in uh, 24, so not uh, this year, but the, the year after. And again, you see, you have this very strange antenna, that's because the wavelength is different, and that's new uh, acquisition uh, antenna that are developed each time with the, the new mission. Uh, and so I will switch to the second part of my talk, which will be more oriented towards uh, image processing and uh, deep learning. Okay, a anyway, I hope you all catch the interest of SAR imaging. Uh, so first I will introduce the statistics and uh, the modeling of SAR images that we will need in the next part. Okay, so what is the problem with SAR images is that you have a very, very high level of noise. So you see here, you have an optical image. So you see, for instance, for a grass uh, area, you, you clearly only have one color, which is the green uh, value of the, of, of the grass. But if you have a look to the same area, which means that it's really a physically homogeneous area, uh, you see that for this polarimetric image, we have lots of fluctuation. So even for an area which should be uh, physically homogeneous, you always have strong fluctuation of the signals that will be recorded by your uh, sensor. Okay, so uh, you have the same uh, problem everywhere in this image. So of, you, of course, you are able to recognize the different elements that you have in this image because you are doing a strong averaging visually when you are looking at this kind of uh, images. Okay, uh, so uh, if you have a closer look, so just take again an optical image and a SAR image. So what you see is that for a given reflectivity, so the reflectivity will be the physical parameter of the surface that is constant for this area because it's only grass in this situation. You see that if you take the panchromatic image and you have a look to the histogram, you see that you have a very narrow information for the optical image, whereas you have a very widespread uh, distribution of the gray level when you look at the SAR image. Okay, and that's very annoying because it's it's a, it's a physically homogeneous area. It's only grass. Okay, so I would expect to have something uh, much uh, narrower than what you have here. And why why is it so problematic that you have a heavy tail of the histogram and you have a very strong representation of the dark values in the histogram? So that's really a pathological situation. Okay. So we'll try to understand why we have such a situation and what uh, people doing image processing have tried to develop to suppress this noise. Okay, so why do we have this situation? Inside each pixel here, you, you, you are observing the uh, modulus of this uh, electromagnetic field, which is represented by the red arrow. But what you have behind the red arrow, in fact, is a combination of all the backscattered waves of the different elementary 
uh, backscattering elements inside the pixel. Inside the resolution cell, you have many different elements compared to the uh, size of the pixels. And uh, at the end, you, you have a complex addition of all these waves and you are observing the red arrow. But for the next pixel, you have a different combination of the elementary waves. So you will have a very different backscattered signal. Okay, so this uh, thing has been modeled by Goodman. So by just uh, making a few hypotheses about the elementary backscattering elements inside the pixels. And uh, you can show that this distribution is coming from the fact that the real part of my uh, electromagnetic field and the imaginary part, they will be both Gaussian, not just the central limit theorem. You are just adding many, many random variables because you are supposing that you have many elementary reflectors inside the resolution cell. So at the end, you have Gaussian distribution for these two uh, values, the real part and the imaginary part, and you can show that under some hypotheses they are independent. So at the end, what you have for the intensity, so again, it's just the magnitude of the complex field, for the intensity it is this exponential distribution that will be uh, expected even for an area which is physically homogeneous. Okay, so it can be explained. So you, you have this random walk in the complex pane. The real and imaginary parts are independent Gaussian. So what do we have for the distribution? Here, the intensity, it is just the modulus of my complex field. Let R be the reflectivity, meaning the physical parameter I am interested in, and that is representing the ground I am uh, imaging. Uh, the distribution of uh, the intensity is the one that we've seen before, but you can improve it a little bit by doing a small averaging, and this small averaging is usually done by the image provider. So they give you an image with a certain number of looks, and this number of looks is this L value, and it's just the way of averaging a few samples. So for instance here, for L equal to 5, they have averaged five samples before giving you the image. Okay, so they have done the in averaging by just uh, averaging intensity values of the pixels. Okay, so you see, of course, the higher the number of looks, the nicer the distribution. But if you do not want to lose resolution, you have to, to, to stay with the single look image, which is just not doing any averaging and just keeping the modulus of the complex field, okay? So in fact, what is interesting is that you, you have a very famous model deriving from Goodman, which is saying, okay, what you are observing, the intensity value, is just the interesting value, the reflectivity, which is uh, really the physical parameter you are interested in, multiply by some speckle, and this speckle, it has this distribution here. Okay, so you, you have a model, saying that, okay, that just like you have usually in image processing, instead that the noise is not additive, but it's multiplying uh, with the interesting parameter, and it has not a Gaussian distribution, but it has this distribution. Okay, so Goodman is predicting this model, so you, you, you know it, so you, you, you can use it in, in your image processing methods. Okay, so maybe a, a nice idea would be to say, oh, we don't mind, we don't like multiplicative noise, but just take the logarithm and we will go back to an additive noise. Okay, so you can do that. You just take the logarithm of that and you end up, of course, with an additive noise of the logarithm of the interesting parameter and the logarithm of the observation. But just be careful, the distribution is not Gaussian. Okay, it's fischer tippett distribution. You just do a change of variable of your speckle noise. And what does it mean? Again, if the number of look is high enough, it looks like a Gaussian, but if you stay with a, a, a very small number of look, single look image, the fischer tippett distribution is not symmetric and it's not centered on, on zero. So just be careful. Uh, it's not, you, you, you have, uh, improve the problem, let's say, because this time you have an additive noise, but it's still not a Gaussian noise. 
Okay, so it means that this situation, which is the one that you are usually having uh, when uh, doing image processing in most uh, modeling, the fact that the noisy image, there's the noiseless image plus some Gaussian noise. In fact, in the case of radar images, it's a noiseless image multiplied by an exponential noise in the case of single look image. So maybe it's, I hope it's clear for you, but it means that the brighter an area, the noisier it is. You, you have much more noise in brighter area because of the multiplication here. And it's what you see here. Here you have a, a very weak noise, but here you have a very high noise. Okay, so the behavior in the image is not the same depending of the, of the, of the radiometric value, if you want. Okay, if you take the logarithm, it's nicer. Now you have an addition of the noise, but just be careful. This noise is fisher tippet distributed. But, but you know how to model the fisher tippet distribution, so, okay, ju just you have to take it into account. Okay, so, but here, you, you agree, I, I am speaking only about uh, the modulus of the complex field. And I've said at the beginning, well, that's nice. I could have interferometric images. I can have polarimetric images, interferometric polarimetric images. So what about this data? Do I have a model? Well, in fact, Goodman has proposed a very, very general model, even for this uh, complex vectorial data. Okay, so I just show you the model. Of, of course, probably you are not really interested in, in the right formulation of the model, but just to, to make you aware that we have some distributions that we know and that we can use in the processing that we will develop. Okay, so what happens in this case? Well, it, it's, the same, uh, it's the same modeling. So I have a complex circular Gaussian distribution for my uh, small uh, vector of observation. And here, the parameters I'm interested in here, they are hidden in this covariance matrix, okay? So that's the, the matrix I would like to recover. And I know that the distribution of my observation, conditionally to this covariance matrix, they have this uh, complex circular Gaussian uh, distribution. Okay, it's established in the Goodman model, okay? But in the same way as before, you could say, oh, but it's too noisy. I, I would like to manipulate images with less noise. So let's do an averaging first. Again, you take L samples and you compute what is called the empirical covariance matrix, which is just uh, this emission product, but computed for the L samples. Okay, so ve very easy to, to compute. You just take a few pixels and you compute this small uh, matrix. And then you will have a different distribution, but you have a, an explicit uh, writing of this distribution that you can use. And it's a complex Wishart distribution. Okay? And here, again, is, it is what we would like to recover. We, we are looking for the sigma matrix. Okay? And we have... We, we, we can observe K or the, or the covariance, empirical covariance matrix. And in both cases, I have some distribution that I know that I can use uh, in, in my different algorithms. Okay, of, of course, don't, uh, uh, well, I mean, you will probably not know uh, this distribution, but I mean, we know them, we can use them. That's my message for this slide. Okay, so we, we have these models, and now what I would like to show you is uh, which kind of image processing methods you could develop to be able to reduce this huge noise that you have on the SAR image. So I, I do not have uh, so much time, so I, I will uh, maybe uh, summarize some parts, but I would like to give you an overview of the uh, methods that have been used in image processing to do that. And then I will just uh, show you some results with deep learning approaches. Okay. So it, it's a very well-known problem. I mean, people are working on uh, the speckle prediction of SAR images since uh, a very, very long time. They have proposed plenty of methods. And of course, these methods they just follow the uh, advances in image processing, okay? 
So you can distinguish uh, three main families of image processing methods to try to reduce the noise. Uh, okay, so the first family is the simplest one, is you are just doing averaging, okay? It's just multi-looking. So I, I told you we have a number of looks, we can do some averaging. That, that's my first family. Instead of doing a, a spatial averaging, you can improve this kind of methods by having a smart way of selecting the samples you would like to average. Okay, so there is a big family of methods based on patches that is just trying to have a better way to select the samples. Instead of taking the pixels around, you try to find the best one that you could use to do the denoising. Okay, first family, selection-based method. Second family, you are doing some modeling. You are injecting some prior. You are saying, okay, images, they are not uh, anything in, in the world. You, you, you have some constraints on images and you try to inject this prior knowledge in, in the image, in, in, the, in the process of denoising. Okay, usually people are using a Bayesian or variational framework, but the, the main idea of this part is that you, you, you are trying to model the solution you are looking for. Okay, so you, you, you are injecting some prior knowledge about images when doing the denoising. And the last family is the more recent one, is, okay, it's too difficult to do the modeling, so let's just learn the model, okay? And to learn the model, you are just showing example and try to, okay, to, to make your network, for instance, uh, learn the, the best way to do the image modeling. Okay, so you see we have three levels. They have been developed at different time of image processing. And I will show you some, okay, some results. I'm not sure I will be able to go in details in, the, in this different family, but I hope you, you will see what, what is the, the break between the, the different families of approaches. Uh, okay, so the simplest way, you take an image and you just do a three by three averaging. Okay, is it a good way to reduce the noise? What I mean, uh, averaging things always decrease the variance of these things. So why not? You see here, well, maybe you don't see very well, but you will have a noise reduction, but of course, you, you have taken a three by three uh, window to do the averaging, so you are just destroying the resolution of your image, okay? Because you are always supposing that the three by three window, they are just coming from the same distribution. They are coming from the same physical parameter on the, on the, on the ground. Of course, it's not true. You see, for instance, for this very small bright point, you are just doing the averaging with points which are coming from the grass. Well, it's, it's not a good strategy. Okay, so you can do that for different size of windows, but each time you increase the window, you are losing resolution. So it's simple, it is fast, but you have a strong resolution loss. Okay, maybe you think, well, that's a very bad way of doing things. It's still used by, for, by many, for many applications, for forestry, for, I mean, multi-looking is, is something that is really a natural way of processing the SAR images. Okay, but we have much uh, interesting things to do, so I, I will not spend lots of time on that, but instead of taking the samples which are just around the pixel, you could have a better way to select the samples, and to do that, you could try to select samples by, you know, testing uh, if the neighborhoods of the samples, they are similar, okay? And that's a family of patch-based methods. What is the principle of these methods? So if you want to detect to, sorry, to denoise the pixel in the middle of this uh, green window, this green patch, well, you, you would like to select in, in, this, uh, in this area of this image all the nice samples that you could use to do the averaging. Okay, you would just keep the averaging ID, but you would like to select the right samples. To, to decide if you can use these samples or not, you will try to compare the green patch with the patch centered on each sample. 
okay so what you can detect is all this all the patch that looks like the green one okay and in this way you will have a stack of similar patches okay once you have the stack of similar patches you have different strategies to do the denoising first strategy you say okay since the patches are similar the central value they should be similar they, they should come from the same distribution so that's a good thing that we combine them okay so you just take the central pixels and that gives you a new estimation for the denoising of this pixel okay so that maybe is the simplest thing to do but you could think oh but we we have a, a a nice set of similar patches why just denoising the central pixel that's not very efficient okay so you can say okay i will use all these similar patches and i will denoise the whole patch and you obtain the orange patch and instead of just putting the central pixel you put back in the image the orange patch okay and the first level is to say oh but that's not efficient enough i can denoise all the stack of patches so instead of just having the orange patches you have the orange and the yellow patches and you back project all of them in the image and of course that's a, the more efficient way you agree because i have plenty of new estimation for all the pixels okay i have done everything in only one step with this branch okay and you do that for many pixels and you will have nice results okay so that's the kind of results you will obtain uh, well it has many advantages because you are not losing anymore the spatial resolution and you just can have the exact same strategy for polarimetric or interferometric data okay because it's just averaging things and you know how to average covariance matrix okay it's, it's not very difficult but uh, you may still have some uh, noise uh, residual and okay maybe you don't see it but in some parts of the image you have destroyed some of the information by doing your combination i mean your patch comparison is not good enough okay because of course the key point it is this stack if my stack is not good my result is not good okay so if i had done small mistake in the patch comparison i will destroy some information okay um for the second uh, family of approaches which are based on bayesian modeling of variational approaches uh, so maybe i will go very briefly on this part but the main idea was to do some modeling of the image okay and to do the modeling of the image in fact you are trying to minimize this kind of energy okay so it's a very common way of uh, uh, you know stating the problem in image processing you are looking for a solution which is x here you have some observation y at your disposal and you are trying to minimize an energy and this energy is a combination between some uh, link between your observation and the solution and some modeling of the solution uh, through this regularization term okay and there have been plenty of uh, proposal for this regularization okay so you can have a well what what people are trying to inject as information in this uh, regularization term is uh, the way uh, images usually are meaning that usually you have smooth images with clear discontinuities and uh, well it's not a cartoon model but it could looks like uh, a cartoon model and it's why you try to put in this regularization okay and then what is the problem once you have uh, said these things you first difficulty how to choose the regularization but let's suppose you have some model the second problem is how you minimize this energy okay and it can be very difficult depending on the convexity or not of these different uh, terms okay so i have not the time so I, I i skip it but okay you have different strategy to do the optimization if you are interested we we can discuss at the end uh, you have different strategy of optimization graph cut based optimization 
uh, splitting approaches and uh, okay that the second part okay this ADMM algorithm for instance and so forth uh, and it can give you interesting results but the problem is that the prior that you have to define is okay you you can try to find the right model but it's usually not so adapted for real images. You see textures, they are not so well preserved and so forth. Okay, so I, I will uh, say a few words of the last family, which is a family based on deep learning approaches. Because in fact, what we will do in the deep learning approaches is to learn the regularization term in many situations. Okay? And... Uh, okay. Here is what you can do with deep learning approaches. So it's just like a teasing, let's say, <laughs> to make you focus on what I will say. But okay, we, we can have much better results with deep learning approaches compared to the results I've shown you before. Okay, but maybe I would like to, to discuss on this slide. So you see, in fact, there are uh, different ways of using deep learning to denoise our images. Okay, so there are four levels to inject uh, deep learning approaches, well, to exploit deep learning approaches to denoise uh, SAR images. Uh, so the first strategy, maybe is the, is the, is the simplest one. So you are not doing anything uh, really uh, using the specificities of the SAR image. So meaning here, you, you use a pre-trained network, and this pre-trained network, it, it has been trained to denoise uh, images with uh, additive Gaussian noise. Okay, so you take a denoiser that has been trained by other people, for instance, and you just try to inject it in your strategy of denoising. Okay, so the, the only difficulty in this case is to inject your model of speckle, because I've said, well, it's not Gaussian, it's fischer tippett distribution, even when you take the logarithm. Okay, so you can do that, but you have to be careful that you have to combine this denoiser that is coming from the denoising of natural images, you have to combine it with a correction to take into account your likelihood, the distribution I have shown you before uh, with the fischer tippett distribution. Okay, but that could be a first strategy, which is called level zero, because you are not training anything for your star image. The second strategy is a supervised training. Okay, so that, that's the usual way of uh, training networks to do denoising. You have a noisy image, you have a ground truth, you train the network to predict the interesting parameters, and you just check with the ground truth by using some loss function that you have done a good prediction. And you put many, many examples to the network. And at the end, the parameters of this network, they will be good to do the denoising task. Okay, so here you see where do we inject the model of uh, physics that we have for the speckle. It is in the way that we create noisy image starting from the ground truth images, okay? Of course, we will not add a Gaussian noise. We will add a speckle noise that is well adapted to our problem, okay? Uh, the second, well, the, the third strategy is the case where you have no ground truth, okay? So you don't know how to have an image without speckle because it does not exist, in fact, an image without speckle. You can try to create images without speckle. That's what we will see in the next slide. But naturally, when you take an image, if you have many elementary scatterers, there is some speckle in your image, okay? So there is no real way of having ground truth. Of course, we, we can take optical images, natural images, but you see the point, these natural images, they do not look like SAR images. They do not have bright points. They do not have bright lines. Okay, so they, they, they would not be very adapted to be the ground truth. Okay, so this strategy here 
is an improvement because in this case we we do not need any ground truth okay and it is based on a quite famous paper which is called noise to noise and this paper is just telling you well you don't need ground truth you just need noisy samples but with an independent realization of the noise if you have that it's just just the same as having the ground truth if you have two realization two different noise reali realization that will provide you with the same amount of information as if you had the ground truth okay so that's a strategy that we could try with our SAR images we could think okay could we take twice a noisy thing okay and as i told you well the satellite is coming back so maybe we could use this new information to to have the second uh, noisy image and the first family of uh, well the first strategy if we give up this uh, zero strategy is the one where you you have only one image you do not even have two noisy images you just really have one okay and the question is how can you train the network by just seeing one image and to do so the idea is to split the samples in some way so that you have half of the sample to be put as input to the network and half of the sample to control the loss so that you will be able to train the network okay so for some images we will see that we have a very efficient way to do that okay i'm checking the time so since i really have very few times uh okay i will skip this uh, this part so okay it just as before i if you are interested i i put the paper on i can discuss with you anyway but i will focus on the on the other approaches so the nice point with this method was that we we were able to process interferometric polarimetric images so you see for instance here we we have a phase which is much uh, cleaner so I don't know if you see here, but we see the shape of the buildings, of the roof of the buildings. So that was a clear improvement of this kind of, of image. But anyway, uh, okay, so the, the, the first strategy dedicated to SAR image was to create a ground truth. How to create a ground truth? What you could do is just to do multi-temporal averaging. You wait for a new image. The satellite is coming back on the same track and you acquire many, many images and you average them and you say oh, okay it's it's a good ground truth and i can train a network uh okay this this ground truth is is nice but uh, there is some problem because it's not taking into account uh, the spatial correlation that you have in real images so that's not a perfect solution so i, I will not insist on this one uh i will also skip the this part i, I will just focus on the, on the last one which is auto supervised training of the network because that's a very nice uh, uh story because it's working only for sar well maybe not only for sar but i mean it's really adapted for sar okay and this is this id okay you you remember i told you okay maybe you 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 have not heard about noise to noise but the idea is that if you take uh, two noisy images you can train a network uh, to to provide you the denoised image okay if the two noise realization are independent okay you see when you have a SAR image uh, if you have a look to the real part and the imaginary part in fact they are independent okay so what you could do is okay you take an image you take the real part and you put it as input to your network and you you train the network to predict the parameter of interest so the reflectivity here and to control uh, the efficiency of your denoising you you define a loss which take into account the imaginary part okay so you do not need any more a ground truth because the the supervision of the loss is done by the imaginary part of the same image okay so you have only one image you have 
acquired a SAR image, a single look uh, complex image. You split it in two parts, real part as input to the network, imaginary part as supervision of the loss of the output of the network, okay? And what is nice is that since these two parts, they are independent, the network we will be able to, to, to try to infer something which is without noise, okay? Because it, it has no, it cannot take into account the fluctuations that you have here. And at the end, the, the training of the network will provide you with denoised images. Okay, so what is the loss that you can define? Here you have the distribution of the uh, imaginary, uh, real and imaginary part. And as I told you, it's very simple. It's two Gaussian distribution and they are independent. So here you recognize the Gaussian distribution of the real part, the Gaussian distribution of the imaginary part. And here is the parameter of interest, which is just the reflectivity of the pixel you are looking at. Okay, so here, if you want to control the estimation of the reflectivity, so the network is seeing only the A value, is trying to estimate the reflectivity value, and you are trying to check if this estimation is in agreement with the imaginary value. And to, do, to check if something is in, a, in agreement with something else, you just usually take the distribution, the likelihood distribution, and you take the neg log likelihood, which is just taking the logarithm, putting a minus sign uh, in front of it. So what you have for the loss is just this thing. You have the B value, which is coming from the imaginary image. You have tried to guess the reflectivity value thanks to the real part. And you see it's just this uh, ratio between the imaginary part uh, taking uh, the square divided by the reflectivity plus, plus the uh, logarithm of the reflectivity. So it's very easy to compute this loss and it's very easy to optimize the network with this loss. Okay, so what is nice with this approach is that you do not need to have twice a noisy image. You just take one image, you split it in two parts, the real and imaginary part, and naturally you are accessing to two noisy realization linked to the reflectivities that you are trying to find. Okay, so that's a very, very nice approach because you do not need ground truth and we have plenty of SAR images acquired by plenty of sensor. So the only tricky thing is that the real and imaginary part, they have to be independent, okay? That's the only thing. You can have spatial correlation, point spread function of a system. You don't mind. You just need that the real and imaginary part, they are not providing the same information. Okay? So, very efficient stuff. Okay, you train the network, you take uh, SAR images, you feed the network, you put the real part, you control with the imaginary part, you can switch, you put the imaginary part, you control with the real part. At the end, you have nice uh, wait here. Okay, and then when you are testing, you have the real part, but you also have the imaginary part. So you ask to the network two different estimation and you just average them to improve a little bit the result. Okay, it, it would be stupid not to use both the real and the imaginary part be because they are just uh, having the same uh, uh, play in, in the game if you want. Okay, and that will give you a very uh, interesting result. So here you have the SAR image, here is the real part. You see, it's a little bit noisier than the intensity image. Here you have the imaginary part, but for both of them, you can have an estimation of the reflectivity, and then you just average them and you have the final result, meaning that you have trained the network without any ground truth, without any twice acquisition of the same scene or whatever, or, okay? So that's a very, very powerful approach, at least for uh, our applications, which are SAR images. Okay, it's working with other kind of uh, images. 
Okay, I, I, maybe I, I skip this, uh, this part. So what is interesting with this framework is that since you are in an auto-supervised framework, you can put in as input to the network uh, many different information. Okay, so here what we did was to, to keep this uh, training by splitting the real and imaginary part, but giving to the network uh, additional information because we had additional images. Be careful, I mean the additional images you may have changes in the image because the, the, when the satellite is coming back, you have six days uh, of uh, difference of, of time. So maybe you have new buildings, maybe you have destruction of the forest of whatever. So you don't want to be influenced. But anyway, you can add all this information and see if it will improve the network. And OK, so you can see it here. So it's a PSNR of also. And that's the increase in the PSNR value if you add over information, over dates, in fact, in, in this situation, over acquisition of the satellite. And you see that it's always improving. Why is it always improving? So maybe you don't see very well with the light, but here, here, here is the original image. Here is the processing uh, I have shown you, which is called Merlin, uh, just with one image. And here is the improvement that you obtain if you add free additional information. So you don't see very well, but for very uh, narrow structures, you, you will have an improvement. So it's especially interesting for road networks and things like that. And here is some over approaches, but uh, you, you can't see it here, but there are some artifacts that are also using uh, temporal additional information just to do a, a comparison. Okay, so this, uh, conclude my, my talk. Sorry, I, I think I'm late anyway, but uh, just a few words. So, well, SAR, SAR imaging is really widely, widely used and more and more used now. There are plenty of sensors that are launched. So not only by uh, space agency, but you have also lots of commercial companies that are starting launching uh, this kind of sensor. So here you, you remember this uh, tanker uh, in the uh, Suez Channel. So you can see this uh, SAR image and, and uh, why do you, well, it was very difficult to have an optical image because it was quite cloudy at that time, but you was sure to have a SAR image. And uh, okay, so the speckle reduction is still a challenging topic. I, I think that deep learning, they really have brought new, very important advances and spe especially the auto-supervised approaches I showed you at the end. But still, uh, there are plenty of challenges if you want to, to deal with the polarimetric images, interferometric images, and uh, take into account some correlations that you have between the signals. Okay, thank you very much. I will end now.